Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday service to worship online from St Barnabas Swanland. Here we are back in our church building, or at least I am. Uh, I'm allowed back in, but sadly we're not open for public worship, and that won't be happening, unfortunately, for several weeks yet by the, by the looks of things. Uh, I hope being in the building will at least help some of you to feel a little bit more at home. But for many others, you won't know our church building, and you're equally welcome to our time of worship together as a church family. Thank you for joining us as we gather again to worship God in Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today and forever. Now, we've had some very sad news this week. Kath Wardle, one of our senior members who's been poorly for a number of weeks and who we've been praying for, has gone to be with the Lord. Uh, she died peacefully on Monday uh, in Kirkella Mansions, uh, we give thanks for Kath's very long and faithful life of witness to God's love. And we'll be remembering her and her family in prayer later on. Now we remind ourselves that we're here today to give worship to the God who loves us and has good purposes for us, who calls us to serve him and his world. And so we're going to do that as we worship, as we read and reflect on his word, as we pray for a world that's in so much need today and as we commit ourselves to serve that world in the name of Jesus Christ. So we're going to go over to Bev and Phil as they lead us in our opening worship. Over to you. Thanks very much, Francis, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's, uh, it's great for us to be back here with mm. you worshipping. So let's join together in our opening song, The Lion and the Lamb. Thank you.
Yes, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us this morning because we know that, that Jesus says that wherever two or more are gathered in his name, he is with us. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are with us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that for each home, for each person, couple, family watching this now, Lord, that they would know that you are with them. They would believe that you are with them. They would love dwelling in your presence, Lord. We would love dwelling in your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with us so powerfully as we join together. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Francis now, thank you. Thank you, Bev and Phil. It's so good to spend time in God's presence and to become aware of the Holy Spirit who's here with us as we worship. We're going to be thinking uh, some more about God's Holy Spirit over the next few Sundays as we approach Pentecost at the end of the month. And we're going to be looking today at how the Holy Spirit was involved in the early church, taking a dramatic turn in a new, in a new direction. God, again, doing a new thing among his people as recounted in the book of Acts. But first time for our Barney slot, another song from our children and young people and their leaders. So join in with the moves and the words if you're able. I love the line here, you are the peace in my troubled sea. This is my lighthouse. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea whoa you are the peace in my troubled sea in the silence you won't let go in the questions your truth will hold your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you to show Love will lead me through 
great stuff. Thanks again, everyone, and especially to Conrad for putting all that together. Now, do get in touch if you'd like to get involved in this way or in other ways with our Sunday services and you haven't been able to yet. We'd love for as many people as possible to get involved and to be part of what God is doing among us during this time of lockdown. And yes, we're another week further on into that. There have been a few baby steps this week towards moving towards the end of all this. And I guess being able to do this from inside the church building today is a small symbol of that progress. Uh, And we can look forward to the time when we can all be back together again, though, as I've said, that's not likely to be for several weeks yet. But as we've been saying all along, we can still be church like this, meeting online, worshipping, praying, listening to what God's saying to us from his word. And so we're going to do that now as we turn to the Bible and a prayer for this season as we do that. Let's pray. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Well, if you've you've been with us over the last few weeks, you'll know that we are following the story of the early church as it grew in the first months and years after the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. And you'll remember that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said that uh, the disciples would be his witnesses. You'll be my witnesses, he said, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we saw that as the apostles told people about Jesus and thousands came to faith first in Jerusalem and Judea, and then as the church was scattered further afield because of persecution, so the gospel spread to Samaria, the next region, and then beyond, through disciples like Philip and converts like the official from Ethiopia, as he was making his way back home, as we saw last Sunday. The gospel is spreading around the region like wildfire, believers responding to God's prompting and sharing the gospel with the people God's led them to. But it hasn't yet reached the ends of the earth, as Jesus said it would. And, you know, there was a reason for that. The world of the Bible, of course, was very different from today's world in so many ways. But in one way, life for God's people, the Jews, was rather like it is today, by which I mean like it is now in this period of trying to defeat the coronavirus. That similarity is that the Jews practiced a kind of distancing, not so much social distancing as religious distancing. You see, faithful Jews who lived by the law of Moses as they understood it kept their distance from non-Jews, from Gentiles as they called them. They didn't mix with them, they didn't share food with them, uh, they certainly didn't touch them, and they definitely didn't go into their houses and socialise with them, not even at a distance. Does that sound familiar? Well, that was true of the first Christians too. The first Christians, not just Jews who hadn't become Christians. See, those early Christian believers in Jesus, they'd been brought up as faithful Jews. And all their life they'd understood that there was this kind of invisible wall between them and Gentiles. A wall which divided them and kept them apart. At first, even Jesus' death and resurrection didn't change that, which meant that initially... Gentiles were pretty much excluded from belonging to God's people, from becoming believers in Jesus. But then something amazing happens, and we're going to hear about it in the next part of our story from Acts chapter 11. Luke tells us that the church had spread across Judea to the coast of Israel, to the Mediterranean, and the Apostle Peter goes to the coastal town of Joppa, which is now known incidentally as Jaffa, where the oranges come from. Uh, And the cakes, of course. No, only kidding. Well, while uh, Peter's there in Joppa, something makes him go to the next city and visit a Roman soldier, an officer, in, in his house, to go into the house of a Gentile. Shock, horror. Uh, Luke, in the book of Acts, actually tells us the story twice. That's how important it is. And in the first telling, he makes a point of saying, Peter entered the house. That was a bigger deal then as it would be for us today to be told you can all start going into each other's houses which of course we can't yet Uh, let's just be clear about that 
But you see, according to his religious distancing traditions, Peter can't either. And yet he does. And even more amazing things happen after that. But when you get back to Jerusalem, some of the more traditionalist believers in the church, Christians, are very concerned to hear that their leader has been into a Gentile home and even had tea with them. And they ask Peter to explain. Well, this is where we pick up the story, and David's going to bring it to us now from Acts chapter 11. Our reading today is from Acts chapter 11, verses 4 to 18. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections, and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, David. Praise God. God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. That was the reaction of those traditionalist believers in Jerusalem. They recognised from Peter, that this was a huge moment in the life of the church as it grew. Gentiles could now become followers of Jesus, and not just Jews. And since for them the world was divided into only two groups, Jews and non-Jews, or Gentiles, that meant what? That now anyone could become a Christian. Anyone from any country can turn to God and be saved. And they just had Cornelius and all his household, friends, family, the lot. What had just happened? Well, let's be clear. It wasn't just Peter changing his mind. This was God at work by his Holy Spirit. First, if you remember from the story, Peter has this vision of all sorts of animals being let down on a sheet, including lots that were forbidden for Jews to eat, non-kosher food. And he hears a voice telling him, kill and eat. And he says, surely not, Lord. Don't you just love Peter? Surely not, Lord. He knows it's God speaking, but he still says no. Do you ever get that? God telling you to step out of your comfort zone and your first response is, no way, God. If so, well, you might need, or I might need, a little bit of prompting just as Peter did here. Uh, This whole thing happened three times, uh, confirming it in verse 10 uh, by uh, something else happening as three men 
at the same time as he's wondering what God is trying to tell him, uh, three men turn up and ask Peter to go with them to the next town, to Caesarea. That's the provincial capital, a Roman garrison town. And go to the house of Cornelius, a Roman officer. A Gentile, of course. And normally that too would be a big no-no. But Peter says in Acts chapter 11 and verse 12, the Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. He knows this is God and that this is something big. Well, he takes six Christians from Joppa with him for moral support, if you like. And when he gets to Cornelius' house, he tells it like it is, as he's reporting this back to the people in Jerusalem, we entered the man's house. Again, a big step for Peter. No more religious distancing. And when he's there, he hears that Cornelius has also had a vision a few days earlier in which God tells him, send for Peter to bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. Now, it's all getting quite complicated, but the point is, this is God at work orchestrating things so that there can be no doubt to Peter or to the church back in Jerusalem when he reports back to them that this momentous change in the way the church would be from this point on was all of God. So Peter brings the message to Cornelius and his household. The message is, of course, the good news about Jesus. And it's all detailed in the first version of the story in chapter 10. Uh, so here in chapter 11, Luke emphasises this time not the content of that message, which was how Jesus' life, death, death and resurrection proves him to be the one God has sent to save the world. But Peter doesn't, uh, Luke doesn't recount the content of the message in chapter 11, but rather its result. What happens? God pours out the gift of the Holy Spirit while Peter is still speaking, before he's got even to the end of his sermon. How very inconvenient. Uh, and as God pours out that gift of the Spirit, as they accept Jesus as Lord, they begin speaking out praises to God. It says, uh, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. And in chapter 10, we hear that that even includes speaking out prayer in different languages or tongues, as the Bible calls it, one of the gifts of the Spirit, which is evidence clearly for Peter uh, that God has really changed these guys' hearts. And then he realises, uh, he's sure now, that becoming uh, a Christian, being a Christian, isn't about becoming a member uh, of a certain nationality or ethnicity. Uh, God has changed their hearts. Uh, it isn't about uh, what background you have. It isn't about simply belonging or obeying rather the law of Moses. It's not even about doing these things as well as recognising Jesus as Messiah and Lord. Now to become a member of the people of God, a believer in Jesus, is purely and simply about receiving the Holy Spirit as you recognise the truth about Jesus and acknowledge him as Lord and Saviour, trusting in him and in his death and resurrection for us. Well, as Peter reports all that back to the Christians in Jerusalem, uh, they get it and it says they rejoice. But you know, the problem is so many Christians ever since have been like those critics were before. Believing that to be a true follower of Jesus, you have to be the right sort of person with the right sort of background, the right sort of upbringing, wearing the right clothes, doing all the right things. When in fact, all that matters, uh, we read from this story, is turning from wrong, trusting in Jesus as Lord and receiving his Holy Spirit. That is allowing him to fill you and take control of your life so that you can become the person God wants you to be, the person you were made to be. That's all that matters. So, for Peter, no more religious distancing. The gospel is really for all. We all get to join in, everybody. As John Wimber, one of the leaders of the move of the Spirit in this country in the last generation, used to say, we all get to play, not just spectators watching a team. This is for everyone. The gospel is for anyone and everyone who believes. And the Holy Spirit is for anyone and everyone. Well, in these unparalleled times for us as a church, we need to hold on to that truth and to act on that truth and to let it be known. If the gospel is truly to be open to all, it might mean changes in the way we do things. Maybe, just maybe, he's teaching us that right now, in the way we're having to do things differently at the moment, 
Uh, it may have made it harder for us regulars to do church, but it's also made it that much easier for people who may never have been before to see what we're about and to hear what we have to say. And then we need to keep saying it, that no one is too far from God's love. God does not show favoritism, Peter says in chapter 10 and verse 34. He accepts people from everywhere who fear him, uh, that is, who honour and worship him. And that means it's never too late to come to God. You can never be too far from him to come back to him. So don't be distanced from God. Come back to him. Be welcomed in. Receive Jesus. Receive the gift of his Holy Spirit. Receive the gift of life. And some words from Ephesians chapter 2 as we end. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh uh, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you, Gentiles who were far away, and peace to those Jews who were near. For through him we all have access to the Father by the one Spirit. Bye.
Let's continue in worship as we turn to prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your protecting hand over our lives, for your goodness, for your grace. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to strengthen us as your people, to bring hope in dark times, to shine your light and to point others to Jesus, that they would come to know him as the way, the truth and the life. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit to help us live for Jesus and make us more like him. Fill us afresh today, Holy Spirit, we pray. Spirit, break out. We want to see your kingdom here. May your church be a beacon of love in these days to reveal your glory to the world. We pray, Lord, for all those who are suffering and struggling right now. For those in hospital or sick at home with coronavirus. Especially any we know, any from our church family and our communities. Bring them, Lord, your comfort and your healing. May they and their loved ones know your peace. May they know you to be a very present help in time of trouble. We give you thanks, Lord, for the life and witness of Kathleen Wardle. Thank you for her deep faith and commitment to you, to this church family, to the Mother's Union and other groups, and for all she gave to us and her many friends at St Barnabas. We pray for her daughter Chris and Mark Hooper and all the family. And Lord, we pray for all who've lost loved ones, friends, family, neighbours in recent days. Lord, death is so hard to bear at any time, but especially right now, Lord, it's so very painful for so many. As you weep with us in our grief, Lord, Draw alongside. May we know your everlasting arms, upholding and sustaining us in our pain. We lift to you all those who are fighting this awful disease in our community and nation. For those working in our health service, our schools, shops, delivery services, for all essential workers for those supporting the community networks to provide help and care. Strengthen and protect them, Lord. And we pray for our leaders, for those who are responsible for deciding about the way forward for our health and our economy. Guide them by your spirit, Lord, we pray. And all those seeking to find treatments and a vaccine. A prayer for peace. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And we draw our prayers together in the words that Jesus taught us, the modern words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we're going to go back over to David, Catherine and Beth for our closing song together. Let's worship the Lord. So we've reached the end of our service together this morning. Thanks so much for being with us and thanks so much for everyone who's uh, been involved this morning. Please do, uh, especially for regulars, keep an eye out for more emails with news and prayer resources coming out this week and for updates on the website. There are also some new prayer resources on the uh, prayer tab on the website, including some super gospel meditations for anyone who'd find these helpful. Do please, of course, keep on supporting the local mutual aid groups as you're able and donating to the Hull Vineyard Food Bank via the box at the back of church. Details of all that and much more uh, is on the uh, latest emails. Uh, one new thing that's happening is that you, or more, more importantly, those who can't access the internet, uh, can also now listen to these Sunday services each week by phoning uh, a local number, Hull 699 444. Uh, that's a local number and so free to most KCOM customers. Do please spread the word about that. And let's continue to keep in touch, to support one another in prayer, by phone, uh, by messaging. 
Uh, keep in touch, keep safe, above all, keep close to the Lord Jesus, who promises that as we draw near to him, so he will draw near to us. Well, let's end by receiving God's blessing together. May our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with the life of his Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you, remain with you, with those whom you love, with all those for whom you pray, now and always. Amen.